If I were to ask each of you individually what the congregation here was worth to you, what would your response be? What's the congregation here at Granby worth to you? How much do you think of it? What do you think its value, its worth is? What do you think about its future? What would you be willing to give to ensure that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, that there was a thriving, vibrant, faithful congregation here? What would that be worth to you? And how valuable do you think that would be? And what would you be willing to do personally? What would you be willing to sacrifice to ensure that would happen? Because that's what this morning's lesson's about. You know, the last couple of weeks, we've heard a, uh, a preacher, a missionary, talk about uh, the work in, uh, in Russia, Ukraine, and places like that. And then Denise and I and Rachel and Victoria had a chance. I think Tyler was there last week too. At um, Spring City. And that morning, one person who had been out of duty for many years came back to the Lord. Well, that was someone who was lost. And that congregation had done a tremendous amount of work prior to that time because they want to make sure there's a congregation there in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. And it all goes back to one of the last things Jesus told His followers. And everything, every verse we're going to read this morning, every text we're going to read this morning will be text and verses and things you have heard for many years. But I want us to look at it in a different light I want us to look at all of these things that we're going to look at this morning from the view of how can I ensure, what can I do to make sure there's a faithful congregation here in the future? And how can I use, how can I apply what I'm ready to hear to help make sure that happens? Jesus didn't leave this earth without a plan. He left his followers with a plan. Now, it was a very simple plan. It was a very straightforward plan. Nothing complicated or complex about it. But he knew that if his church that he said he was going to build in Matthew chapter 16, if that church was going to come into existence, if that church was going to grow starting at Jerusalem and spreading out, that his followers had a responsibility. There was something they must do. Here's what he told them they needed to do. First of all, I want us to look <clears throat> at Matthew's account of what we commonly call the Great Commission. The very end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28... Jesus leaves His followers with a commission. That commission is for you and me too. It's just as if Jesus is standing here telling us these very words. If you want a congregation to be here in the future, He says, this is what you need to do. He says in verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and upon earth. And he says, because of that authority, here's what you must do. You must go, therefore, and make disciples. Okay, there's our, there's our challenge. There's our commission. Because that's what you want to do. You must do if you want to have a congregation here. You have to do what? You have to go and make disciples. Learners. You need to go make learners followers of me. And he says they can come from all nations. It doesn't make any difference their backgrounds. It doesn't make any difference what they look like. 
all nations. And of course, I'm applying it not halfway around the world. I'm applying it here. So everywhere you go is a potential learner, a potential disciple. That's what Jesus says. He says, this is what you must do. You must baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. See, you don't just baptize them. You teach them. And what do you teach them? You teach them that they need to observe everything, all things that I've commanded you. And he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Even to the end of this world. He says, I'll be with you if you do that. So there's the commission, there's the plan, there's the guidelines. If you want to have a faithful, growing congregation in the future, here's what you have to do. You understand that the authority for this comes from me, Jesus says, and you've got to go. That implies effort, doesn't it? When I was young and my parents told me to go do something, that meant that there was effort on my part involved. I needed to do something. So disciples aren't miraculously made out of thin air. You have to go make disciples. You have to go make followers. You go make learners. They become Christians. They become children of God when they are immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But you must teach them that they need to observe and follow all things that Jesus had commanded them. In Mark's account, he adds something in addition to that. Notice Mark's account, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. But especially notice verse 15. Mark 16, verse 15. Jesus is talking to the same ones and he says... Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A better translation of that, go there, is a participle in the Greek language. Going into all the world, preach the gospel. So wherever you go, you're going into all the world. He's not referring there that uh, you have to go uh, halfway around the world to preach the gospel. He says wherever you go... There's an opportunity to tell people the good news. That's what gospel means. There's an opportunity to tell people the good news. So you, you, you do that. Well, what is the good news? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the good news. <coughs> Simple, isn't it? Now Luke's account adds one more thing. Luke chapter 24. Beginning in verse 46. Luke 24, verse 46. Jesus says to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. It was necessary. It was essential. Otherwise, salvation wouldn't be possible. He says, Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Here's how we can use that today. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached to everybody beginning here. Here. That's where we need to start teaching and preaching and telling people that repentance and remission of sins is necessary. That's what we need to do. There's a great account in John's account of the gospel, you, if you're still there in Luke, turn a few pages over to John chapter 4. He gives us an account of how we can do this. He gives us an example. Well, when we go into all the world, how do we do that? What do I say and what do I do and where do I go? Well, he gives us an example. John chapter 24, <clears throat> Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well. He talks to her. 
which is very unusual. First of all, she was a Samaritan and he was Jewish and they didn't have anything to do with one another. He was male and she was female and they didn't have anything to do with one another. So a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman was very, very out of the ordinary. But Jesus is just at a well getting water and what does he do? He uses that as an opportunity to tell her who he was, the Christ, the Messiah. So in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, she finds out that Jesus is the Messiah. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went away into the city and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Then it talks about the, uh, the fact that Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. Verse 35, Do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they're already white for harvest. And he's probably seeing at that time the people coming from the city to him. So he says, look, there's the harvest. It's right there. It's coming toward you. It's there. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. Do you notice what he said? He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Now notice verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. What did the woman do? She had talked with the Messiah. So what does she do? She goes back to the city, to the people, and she says, Could this be the Christ? He told me these things. And what was the result? Many of the Samaritans believed in Christ because of what she said. Was she some great speech maker or preacher or teacher? Nope. She wasn't any of those things. All she simply did was tell people what had just happened. I've met the Messiah. And as a result, many people believed in Christ as the Messiah. That was very simple, wasn't it? There wasn't anything complicated about that. She didn't have to take a bunch of classes to learn how to do that. It was very simple and straightforward. She simply told others about what she knew. There was nothing long and elaborate and complex and complicated about it. She simply told them what she knew. And as a result, many came. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Very similar words here. But I want to notice, I want you to notice something that is necessary for you and I to do. I hope you do this every day. If you don't, I encourage you to start doing it. Verse 35 of Matthew 9. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, this is the feeling you and I have to have right here. When he saw the multitudes, what happened? He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, here's what we need to do. Pray the Lord of, of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So I'm going to ask a personal question. Do you every day pray for the future of this congregation? Do you every day do that? Because it's a necessity. If you want the congregation to be, again, alive and faithful and working, 
5, 10, 15 years in the future, then you need to be praying that will happen now. Pray that it will happen now. Pray that there will be a great harvest. Pray that people will listen. Pray that people will come. That's what you and I need to be doing. And then in Luke, Luke chapter 10, we learn something there that I think is very important for us as well. First two verses of Luke chapter 10, this is what we're told. Luke chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 says, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before His face into every city and place where He Himself was about to go. Then He said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. They went out in pairs. It's always a great way to go. And they did what? They went to every city and every place. There's the field. It's white unto harvest. And Jesus says, this is what you need to do. You know, after Jesus gave that commission in, in Matthew 28 and those other places we, we read, Mark 16 and Luke 24, days later, of course, they're still in Jerusalem because the apostles have been told, well, you wait here until power comes from on high, till the Holy Spirit comes to you. And then what happened? Well, of course, we read in Acts chapter 2 what happened. Peter and the other apostles stood up. They were talking to Jewish people. So they told them what the Jewish scriptures said about the Messiah. And after hearing that, that they had crucified the very one they were waiting on, they responded, verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? So Peter and the others told them what they needed to do, and that was repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And a great number were added to them that day. In the beginning of the church, there in Jerusalem, just like Jesus had told them it would in Luke chapter 24. Beginning at Jerusalem. And then it spread to Judea and Galilee and Samaria and on and on and on. And the plan was the exact same plan today. One person told another person who told another person who told another person. And that's the same plan that exists today. It's no different. The plan hasn't changed in any way. So it's you and I that need to take the gospel to the world. In Acts chapter 17, we read about what some of the Christians did. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. <clears throat> This is what happened when uh, Christ was being preached there in this city. In verse 6 it says, they were looking for, uh, uh, they were assaulting or going to assault, take over Jason's house, trying to find Paul and the others. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too have come here too. They turned the world upside down. Why? Did they go in with some sort of militant force? No. All they did was went into the city and taught Christ. That was it. They just taught Christ. And that turned the world upside down. They weren't afraid. <coughs> They weren't afraid. They had conviction. They weren't afraid to confess Christ. They went into the world and made a difference. This is something that was written in the year 112. Now think about 112. The Lord's church has been on earth, you know, what, 80 years or so? In the year 112, this is Pliny the Younger, writing in Bithynia. 
talking about Christians, and he talks about them as a lot of Romans did at the time, talks about them as a cult. These are his words. It, and he's talking about the church, Christians as a cult, is not only in the towns, but villages and rural districts too, which are, this is his word, infected through contact with this wretched cult. Notice how it was spreading? By contact. I think, though, that it's still possible for it to be checked and directed to better ends, for there is no doubt that people have begun to throng the temples, which were almost entirely deserted for a long time. What was the result? People started thinking about religion again. See, he calls them a cult, and he says they're everywhere. They're in the cities, they're in the villages, they're in the rural districts. How were they growing? By contact. There was a personal face-to-face -face interaction. And there is simply nothing that replaces that. There's nothing as good as that person-to-person, -person, face face-to-face contact. One of the reasons I think that is so effective is because people know that you care when you are talking to them face to face. You took time to sit down with them and talk to them about what you thought was important. So no wonder that has great results. So what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to sacrifice so that there is a church here in five years and ten years and fifteen years and twenty years? What are you willing to do to help ensure that happens? I want to end with a quote. I don't remember the person who made this quote, but it's it will cause us to think, and I hope you think about each of these words in this quote. He wrote, When I finish my life, I want to know that the Church of Christ has been safely preserved and is being placed in the trust of faithful disciples who will carry it onward in our absence. Now, isn't that what it's about? I'm not going to live forever, and neither are you here on this earth. So if you and I want the congregation to be here filled with faithful disciples, then what do you and I have to do? We have to pass that on. We have to do everything in our power so that the church has been safely preserved. And we have placed it in the hands and the trust of faithful disciples, learners, followers, who will do the same thing, carry it onward when you and I are gone. Many of you are about my age and, and remember when we were younger here about many of the people who were carrying it on and guess what? Many of them are gone. Many of them are gone. Most of them are gone. Well, that's the way it's going to be with you and I. Those are my age. One of the days we're going to be gone. And if we want the church to be in existence here, and faithful, then you and I are going to have to do what they did. Exactly the same thing. Leave it in the hands of faithful disciples. So what are we willing to give to make sure there are faithful disciples in the future? That's the question. That's the challenge. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to give? This morning, the invitation is yours. I, I hope there are those here that have been thinking about becoming a Christian by being baptized and, and having their sins washed away. And I hope this morning is the morning they're, they're going to do that. Or I pray that there are those here who have not been living the kind of life that they know they should and that they're willing to come and make that confession and ask for forgiveness. Think about if you're one of those people and if you are, I encourage you to come as we stand and sing this song. Let us stand, please.